Hallelujah. We're going to continue the study on Joshua. And uh, as you can see, I'm taking my time with this. We haven't even got to Jericho yet, which I'm really looking forward to, but we're not going to get there today, that's for sure. But, you know, last week we were looking at the significance of the tribes. And I've been pondering this because obviously Joshua had instructed them to get the 12 stones from the river. What, and the 12 stones had to be collected by one from each tribe. And all the way through scripture, the, the importance of these tribes, I think, can't be um, overstated. Because, you know, we know that there was a time when 10 tribes were taken off and two remained. But God brings them back all the way through. They are there in the book of Revelation. They are there in Ezekiel's final temple. And God has not given up on the tribes. And uh, it just amazes me, really, because here he took this man, Jacob, who, you know, wasn't a great character. Let's face it. He was known as the deceiver, the grabber of heels. And God said, no, I'm going to make you Israel. You know, and he brought forth from Jacob these 12 boys that were going to be the tribes of Israel. And it kind of gives me the chills to think about it. I think of these 12 lads, these strapping young men. And, uh, you know, you, you just think of them all sitting around, chatting with each other. Asher and Nephitali and Zebulun and Dan and Gad and Judah and Reuben and all the rest of them. Amazing. But God had a significant plan for these boys. And the great thing is, as we look at their lives, they seriously mess up, all of them. Seriously. I mean, they, what they wanted to do to Joseph is nobody's business. They wanted to kill their own brother, for goodness sake. So, and they, one of them had an affair with Jacob's concubines. You know, they were really all over the place. They took things, hot-headed young men, basically. But I love the way that God um, has a plan for them. And even in that eternal city, the gates of that eternal city are going to be named after them. And what I love as we've been looking at is the redemptive name of each of these boys. Now, I explained last time that uh, Dan wasn't mentioned in Revelation 7 and a possible reason why, which was very interesting. But, you know, Dan comes back. Dan is in Ezekiel's final temple. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's important for us to remember that. Now, the, when they came out of the Jordan, when they came through and crossed over, they were now leaving the old behind, crossing over into the new they'd been in the desert they were now going to inherit a land and as they came through joshua said pick up the stones because the first thing you've got to do is build an altar to the lord so you never forget what he's done for you and we saw that we need to take hold of this because as we need to build our altar to the lord an altar is a place of sacrifice and a place of worship. And we now come, our sacrifice that we bring before the Lord is a sacrifice of praise and worship according to uh, Romans. So we looked at the first four boys and their redemptive names. 
And Leah and Rachel gave them such incredible, significant names. And we can see that we need to take the hold of these, uh, what these names mean for us as we build our altar. And the first child, the Reuben, was God sees. And we know that we have to see him as well. The first thing that happens is you suddenly see. You know, we probably had some introduction to the Bible, but there was a moment when in your heart you went, I see it now. I see it. You have to see it. Your spiritual eyes open. And then you train yourself to hear from the word of God. What has God got to say? Simeon. And then Levi, you're part of a body. You're not alone. You're not on your own. You are part of the body of Christ. And then when that hits you, you realize that your response is Judah is to praise him. So let's move on now. Um, I'm hoping to get through all of them this week because after the break, I want to look at uh, Gilgal and, and what happens with the commander of the army. But we may or may not get there, I don't know. I'm not going to spend over long on each one because this could be such a long teaching in, in and of itself. When we look at the prophecies that Jacob gave each one, that Moses gave each one. But I'm really more going to concentrate on the names that Leah and Rachel gave these boys. Because that to me is a redemptive purpose of them. And they may not have realized what they were doing, but names are so important in Hebrew. They're really important. And I believe they're important for us too. So the fifth boy that was going to be born was Dan. Now, each of these boys had a symbol, and Dan had two symbols. One of them was a snake, and one of them was scales. So, you know, we know that Dan if you like, lived up to that symbol in the fact that it was Dan who raised an altar um, in, the, in the country of Dan, he raised an altar that was not to the Lord. And that's why it's believed he's not mentioned in Revelation 7. They had two of these uh, pagan altars, one in Dan and one in Bethel. But when, what happened with his birth, Leah had had her four boys. The favored wife of Rachel was barren. But what happened in those days and the same principle Sarah brought into, brought into Abraham's life. They believed in that culture that you could take a handmaiden and if she got pregnant by the husband and gave birth, the, the wife that maybe was struggling to have a child could claim that child. And that's what Sarah did with Hagar. She didn't wait for the Lord. She used a custom that was in the culture around her. And this morning we were praying about you know, how culture affects us and how we can not stand out as the light of God and the salt of the earth. And it's so important that we don't get swallowed up by culture. But God even uses this. God knew that Jacob was going to have 12 boys. And he ended up having six with Leah, two with uh, Bilhah, another two with Zilpah, and two with Rachel. So this formed 
Israel, the nation of Israel was built on these 12 boys. So, I, you know, that gives us such hope because they were all over the place. And even their birth is a bit questionable. But nevertheless, you know, even David, King David, who we, you know, God looked at David and said, that's a guy who wrote a heart after my heart. But he had many wives. And I don't believe that was ever God's plan or the best plan, put it that way. So, you know, hopefully you guys that are married will stick with the one you've got. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> So Dan, when uh, Rachel had not had any, so she took her, uh, her maid, Bilhah, and gave Bilhah to Jacob to have a child with her. And she called this child Dan. And when Dan was born, the first thing she said was, God has vindicated me. God has justified me. And we are now justified by the blood of Jesus, aren't we? Even though we get it all wrong, even though we're all over the place, he has chosen to justify us as if we have not sinned. But it, it, it also can mean to judge, and that's why he's represented by the scales. And God gives us, uh, hopefully, a godly judgment where we are to discern things, but only in God. You know, not to judge others, because that judgment will come back on ourselves, but to, to use the, the gift of judgment, which is discernment. And there's a very thin line between those two. But God has vindicated us because he has taken our sin. He's made us pure and holy in his sight. That stone we can put in our altar to the Lord. It's all what Christ has done for us. Damn. Important part of who we need to do, who we need to be. You see, all these names were redemptive, redemptive, despite the character. Then along came uh, another boy, um, also by Bill Hart. Uh, I don't know how she fared in all of this, but Leah claimed this child as well. And uh, she named Rachel named the child, I will hasten to add, not Bilha, Rachel. And Rachel called him Nefertali. Isn't that a great name? <laughs> that is just such a wonderful name. You don't hear many Nefertalis around. You hear some of the others, but you don't hear Nefertali very. I've not heard of a Nefertali, but I think it's kind of a great name. So Nefertali, he's symbol was actually a hind, you know, like a deer. And um, he, he's, when Rachel saw this boy, claiming it for her, she said, I have struggled, I have wrestled, and now I've got my boys. I have got Dan, and I've got Natali, even though she didn't actually give birth to them. I have struggled. And there is a struggle with God. And I believe it's a very healthy thing when we wrestle with God. Jacob, you know, he had the visions um, at Bethel of the open heaven, but he didn't become Israel until he struggled with God, until he wrestled with God. And there are times when it's so good to wrestle with God and say, God, I am not leaving here until you touch my life. And that's exactly the place where Jacob got when he wrestled with God. I don't, I'm not going to let you go 
until you touch me. And I think God loves that. I think God loves a good wrestle. He's more than able to knock us out on the floor when he does that occasionally. But he likes a good wrestle. I'm not going to let you go, God, until you reveal this to me, until you touch my life. That from this day, when I go forward, my walk is going to be different than it was before. And Jacob never walked the same again because his hip was a bit out of joint. But he walked a different walk. He knew God. And God had taken him through some severe training ground before God could say, now, you're Israel. Now, you're a father of a nation. Hallelujah. So Rachel uh, has got these two boys. Wrestle with God. Always wrestle with God. Don't let go of him until he reveals what you want him to reveal. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. <coughs> right, <coughs> so now Leah had stopped having children. And she thought, what is good for the goose is good for the gander. I think that's the same. And so she got hold of her handmaid, Zilpah. And she gave Zilpah to, to Jacob. So Jacob was having a good time with all these women, wasn't he? <laughs> you know, we won't go into that. But anyway, uh, Zilpah gave birth. And um, when this baby was born, Leah called him Gad. Because obviously she was very glad. <laughs> Gad, you don't hear too many Gads about either. And she said, now I've got good fortune. Now I've got good fortune. And um, Gad can actually mean two things. It can mean good fortune, a blessing, a prospering. And God loves to bless us, doesn't he? You know, the promise to Abraham that is amen in Christ for us as well, is that God blessed Abraham to be a blessing to others. God wants us to walk in blessing so that we can in turn bless, because you can't give what you haven't got. So God gives us good fortune, he gives us gad. But it can also mean troop or invader. And uh, that's a very interesting one because we have to invade the enemy's territory. We are called into this army of God. We're part of the troops of God. We're part of this, um, yeah, there's a fight going on. We need to put our full armor of God on because there's a battle. There's a battle. Mm -hmm. So we build our altar on the blessing and good fortune, but being prepared for the fight. We are having to take hold of God in our altar. And so then she decides that, okay, Rachel had two sons by her handmaid, and we're going to try this route again. And this time, Zilpah gave birth to a son called Asher. I really like that name, Asher. Um, Asher's symbol, by the way, was olive trees. Gad's symbol was uh, three tenths. And there's reasons for all these things, but I haven't got time to go into that now. I just want to concentrate on these mm -hmm. names. And when Leah realized Asha had been born, she said, now I am happy. <clears throat> now I'm full of joy. And um, joy is something deeper than 
happiness. And I believe it's the biblical sense of that joy that we need to take hold of. Because happiness, when the world looks at that word happiness, it depends on what happens in your life. If things go well, then you may be you're happy. But the joy of the Lord is something much, much deeper. It's not subject to circumstances. And that's why, you know, you hear of, uh, amazing testimonies and stories of people that have gone through the worst scenarios, but they're still rejoicing in God. Because nobody can take the inner peace and joy from you because it's not subject to circumstances and I did understand that once um, uh, when I lost my mom it, I was very close to my mom and it was really hard for me to uh, you know to sort of come to terms with that but it was like one day I just realized that the Lord kind of peeled everything back to show me the deepest part of me. And when I saw the deepest, deepest, deepest part of me, there was joy there. Because that joy was nothing to do with what had happened. That joy had everything to do with him in me, the hope of glory. And that's what we take hold of, that joy of the Lord. You know, Jesus said, for the joy set before me, I endured the cross. Well, let's face it, he wasn't happy on the cross. It's impossible. But for the joy that was before him, because he knew that that was just a means to an end. It was temporal. That despite the pain, despite the suffering, the joy was going to come from doing that. And that joy is us, his bride. His bride. And his bride meant more to him than any suffering or pain or hurt or situation because he knew the ultimate result. And that's why, you know, it's important for us to take hold of Asha, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so if we can, you know, look past the current things that make you wear us down, and think, no, I'm going to draw from that joy because that is when I'm strong. That's when I get the strength to do all that I need to do. Now, Leah, although she'd got the two boys now with Silpar, uh, there was a whole thing for mandrakes and all sorts of things going on. You see, they were dipping into pagan type things, you know, and goodness knows, but God, God can turn everything around. And there is spiritual realities that we do not understand necessarily. And I did a whole teaching once on grace being greater than law, because there are times when God seems to go against his own law because love and grace triumphs. And just to show that I'm not completely saying something <laughs> off the wall, you look at the story of Ruth, a Moabite, wasn't meant to be in the genealogy of Jesus, is in the genealogy of Jesus, and didn't wait the 10 generations to become clear which is in the law. So the, there is something greater. And in Ruth's case, it was to Naomi, your God is my God. Your people are my people. Because faith triumphs. 
faith is greater. So although there's these crazy things going on, there's a faith element and God's purpose, which is far greater and far bigger. And that's why sometimes there is a mystery and we just have to leave it at that. There are things that we probably won't understand until we get to glory because there is a deep mystery. Sometimes God will show, but sometimes I'm just not sure. But there's something, there's a power uh, in the spirit realm. Now, Leah now was going to have another baby. She was pregnant again. And this baby was called Issachar. Issachar. And uh, he had, again, two, two uh, symbols. One was a donkey and one was the sun and moon. And uh, when Leah saw him, she said, God has rewarded me. God has given me recompense. God has given me a prize. God has given me wages. And, and you know, the words to Abraham, which I love, is God said, I am your great reward. And now she got this fifth boy, Issachar. And uh, God gives us rewards. Jesus said this in Matthew. Uh, where am I? Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. And we know that we're not to store our riches up on the earth, but to store our riches up in heaven because we will be rewarded for what we've done. And uh, that system of reward, I think, is going to be quite shocking for all of us because it's going to be such a big surprise who gets the greatest rewards. And I think there's going to be little old ladies that nobody ever knew about, young children that lost their life early and did something remarkable. Who knows? But God knows. And our reward is always in heaven, not on earth. So as we take hold of the stone of Issachar, we know that we're going to build rewards in heaven by doing the things of the kingdom. Now, the other great thing, of course, with the tribe of Issachar in 1 Chronicles 12, it says that Issachar knew the times and seasons. And this anointing of Issachar is so important because, you know, we can so easily get a timing wrong. It can be the right thing, but if it's out of timing, it won't work. And I think that's the problem with uh, many of us. We might hear something from God, but we just don't bring it or work it through at the right season. But Issachar knew the times and seasons. And it's an anointing that I believe is so powerful. Lord, help me to, to discern the right time because then it will be powerful. You know, some may of uh, you may have received a prophetic word and you've never seen that prophetic word come about. It's remained, if you like, in the spirit realm and you've tried to make it work and it hasn't. I know when I first became a Christian, God gave me such a heart for unity and I tried everything I possibly could to try and get something going. But I hadn't gone through the training ground. I, I, I hadn't done my bit of sowing into these fields. I hadn't worked with enough people and got alongside people and built relationships. I, I tried to do it out of God's timing in my own strength. 
And then years later, I found myself really at the heart of working with so many leaders and, and being in unity with others from all sorts of denominations and uh, expressions. So the word was right, but the timing was not right. Don't do things in your own strength is a very good message because it won't work. There's a way to get hold of the anointing of the God. It's a very profound anointing. Then Leah went on to have her sixth and final son, Zebulun. What a, isn't that a strong name, you know, Zebulun? <laughs> and his symbol was ship. And you can just see this strapping young man called Zebulun. And when she had Zebulun, she said that now God is on with me. She's got six boys. God is on with me. God has given me a gift. God has lifted me up. God has brought forth this present. And it's wonderful because I've got Zebulun now. <laughs> I have six of them and I've got Zebulun. I am now honored. That was her final boy. She had Dinah after, but now she had her six sons. And, uh, you know, honoring is such an important part of, of the altar that we build. Um, Danny Silk wrote that book, you know, Culture of Honor and, and Honoring People, and how we need to honor one another, how we need to respect one another and look at our, each other's gifting and acknowledge that but also to honor God, never to take his name in vain, to honor him and he in turn will honor us. Honor, it's such a, a great word. And I just see that, you know, one of my absolute hates in life is rudeness. I, I just, it just, when people are rude, it takes everything in me to be gracious to them. And you know you've got to be anything. You know, I don't want to be gracious to you because you're so rude. <laughs> and I'm probably not that gracious. The other day, you know, I was walking Coco, narrow path. The guy was coming along with a pram and a big dog. And I dived into the bush holding my little dog and nothing. And I could, it just came out of me. I said, a thank you would be nice. <laughs> I thought, you know, I really hate rudeness. And I'm sorry to say, I'm not very gracious in a car. I will let anyone go if I think about it in time. And, and it's safe to do so. But if they don't wave at me, I think, oh, wish I hadn't done that now. <laughs> Truth is coming out. You see, I'm not that gracious. But it's honouring one another, isn't it? When, you know, it's so good to say thank you. It's so lovely when people say thank you. Honouring is part of the altar that we have to build. I've got a long way to go, you can see that. <laughs> it's so important. Um, yeah, so Zebulun, Zebulun. Wow. Now, Rachel, this favored wife. Now, she had waited a long time. And this must have been incredibly hard for Rachel. God had closed her womb. She got the two boys through her handmaid but she hadn't actually had any children herself. And there's her sister Leah parading these six boys. It must have hurt, let's be honest. And I'm sure Leah was hurt too, knowing that she played second fiddle to Rachel. Both these women had gone through quite a lot. 
And Rachel really wanted a, a child. And God granted her a boy. And young Joseph was born. Now, just to explain something, because I know people get very confused in this. When you get the 12 listed, because Levi became the priestly tribe, his right to a division of land was taken away because his land would now he would live within the tribes themselves. So he never had an allocation of land. Reuben, who was the firstborn son of Jacob, you would have thought would have got the double inheritance. You see how an inheritance worked in those days. If you had four children, four boys, your inheritance would be divided into five. Two portions given to the eldest son and the rest would receive one portion. So the eldest always got the double and the rest got their portion. So one would expect Reuben to have been the heir to the double portion. Now, Reuben had a fling with one of Jacob's concubines, whether it was Silka or um, Bilal, we don't know, probably. And that put him out of favor. But maybe Joseph, because he was the firstborn of Rachel, and let's be honest, Jacob wanted to marry Rachel, thought he'd married Rachel, and had ended up with Leah first. So whatever the reason, Joseph became the one that inherited the double blessing. And so these two sons were listed as tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. It's the double blessing, it's the double inheritance. So that's why in scripture, you ver when the 12 were mentioned, Levi is maybe not mentioned because he hasn't got an allocation of land. And Joseph may not be mentioned because now he's mentioned through Ephraim and Manasseh. So I hope that sort of cleared up because I know it can get really confusing and I used to be terribly confused, but if you can get your head around it, it really does help, actually. Um, and, and sometimes they're a little bit interchangeable, but that's just <laughs> more, slightly more confusing. But anyway, when Joseph was born, this first son of Rachel, and the very favorite of Jacob, which is a little bit unfair on the others too. So no wonder they, they, they weren't very happy about Joseph. But when he was born, Rachel looked at this boy and said, God has taken away my reproach. And it is a picture of the cross because where was our reproach taken away? On that cross of Christ. He took everything into himself to set us free. When we look at Jesus, when we look at the cross, that was the end of the reproach. The, the stone of Joseph, he has taken away my reproach. He has taken away our guilt. He's taken away our wrongdoing. But now, even though we're in this transitional period, God looks at us and he said, I have made you holy. Because of the blood of Christ, because of the cross, he's taken away the reproach. And uh, then she went on to say, may the Lord add, may the Lord increase. And 
that's what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to bear fruit that will last, to increase. And, um, you know, he, you see, I, I, I like to put it this way. When Jesus was on the cross, he was Christ. Obviously, he is the Christ. There, there, there weren't yet Christians. And this one who was Christ was the seed that fell into the ground that Satan thought, got him, he's dead, finished, that's it, I've won. But what the enemy did not reckon on was once that seed had fallen into the ground, it would produce many. And on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead, got up, got on with it. But now, can you imagine Satan? I just love to picture this. He thought he triumphed at the cross and then suddenly all these little seeds were coming up all over the place. And there's hundreds of them, there's thousands of them, there's millions of them. So what was contained in just the body of Christ has now become billions <laughs> over the centuries. His worst nightmare. May the Lord add, may the Lord increase. And God always wants the kingdom of God to be increased, to advance. And now um, Joseph with Ephraim and Manasseh and just like uh, with, with Jacob, Esau was the firstborn, but Jacob inherited the promises. Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh was the firstborn, but Ephraim became the head of the tribe. And uh, Jacob uh, prophesied that over Joseph's sons. He wasn't particularly um, pleased with that, but <laughs> that's God does this. God, God does not stick to the rules at times. He does his thing. Uh, just to, to say that Ephraim's name means uh, to be fruitful, double fruit, which of course became one of the biggest tribes. And Manasseh's um, name means uh, he makes me forget, which is interesting. Now, poor old Rachel. Now, Rachel. You see, again, you see throughout these stories the influence of the culture. And although they were people that God had his hand on, they still drew from things they should not have drawn from. Now, Rachel's, you know, was with Laban. And Jacob had to work for her hand and Leah. And then they were going to do a run-up, remember? And they were leaving Laban. They were going back to the land that was promised to Abraham. And Laban caught up with them. And Laban was fuming because somebody had stolen his gods that he had. Now that in itself gives a bit of a warning. And guess who had stolen them? Rachel. Why? Why did she do that? I don't know what these gods were, little Buddhas or whatever, I don't know. But she sat on these gods and she hid them. But she'd stolen them. And Jacob didn't know she'd stolen them. And he said, whoever has done this, they will die. He spoke it out. Not knowing his beloved Rachel was the one who done it. And that's why we've got to be very careful with curses. Very careful. She was cursed. And that's all in Genesis 31 and 32, I think. Now, she gives birth to another son, and it's really sad. It's really sad. I'm just going to read this bit. 
in Genesis 35. Sixteen. Then they moved on from Bethel. While there were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, don't despair for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son ben Oni. ben Oni. And ben Oni means the son of my sorrow. Ben is son. ben Oni is the son of my sorrow. She was dying. And giving birth to this child had caused her to die. And she knew that. He is the son of my sorrow. And Jacob um, turned around and wasn't going to have her. He was not going to have this child called ben -Oni. It goes on, but his father named him Benjamin. And Benjamin means son of my right hand. Jesus was the man of sorrows. Jesus was the one who Isaiah describes, you know, the suffering servant, this man of sorrow. He took all the rubbish of the world into himself. He died on that cross. But the Father rose him up and seated him at the right hand of the Father, son of my right hand. Just like Jacob, he took the man of sorrows and he said, no, this child is going to be the son of my right hand. And so he wasn't locked into Benoni, but he was raised up and lifted up to the highest place that at his name, this is Jesus obviously, at the right hand of God, that every knee will bow. He exalted him way above all things. And so, you know, we, we need this. God's taken our reproach away and God has taken our sorrows and he raises us up to be seated with him in heavenly places. And because we are raised up and put in those heavenly places with Christ Jesus, we can see things from God's perspective. So our altar to the Lord, as we take hold of these 12 things, we can see that they build us as a person because we are now that altar of the Lord. We are now the one that God works through. And just like when Elijah built that altar, on Mount Carmel, even though the, the tribes had split, he still took the 12 stones and he built the altar with 12 stones for the fire to come. And we want the fire of the Lord, don't we? And I think these 12 stones, the names of these 12 boys, are so powerful and so relevant to us that as we take hold of their redemptive purposes that their mothers spoke over them and we say we're going to be the take hold of the redemption of their names that we can become who he wants us to be and it's the book of Joshua is this incredible journey. And that's why I'm taking my time with it. 
because it's so easy to go to the main highlights. But God was doing bit by bit by bit by bit all the way through because this was a transitional time and we are in a time of great transition. And we need to get hold of God, I think, in a way that we've not got hold of him before. So let's take these, these 12 stones and build our altar, knowing that as we do, God can work in us and through us in the way that we really want him to. Amen. 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 So, Father, thank you that your word is so powerful that every part of it is there for such a specific reason. And, Lord, I thank you that these boys built Israel. They were the foundations of Israel. And their names are on the gates in heaven. And a gate is where people can come in and know you. And we give you praise and we give you glory, Lord. And I pray that you enable and help each one of us to take hold of these stones as we build this prayer altar of worship to you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.